Hey guys, today we're in the book of Joshua chapter 11. Now we have read about Israel, how Israel has come across the Jordan River from the east to the west, taken out the middle part of Israel. They have taken now the southern part and today they will take the northern part or the biggest part uh, of all of the promised land. And so here uh, we start in verse 1. When uh, Yabin, the king of Hazor, heard this, uh, he sent Yohab, the king of Madan, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Ashva. And so here's what's happening, much like the south, right? Kings here, and they're sending to other kings and other kings and other kings, and they are making a coalition, right? So uh, when it says the king of uh, of Hazor, this is the largest section, largest community uh, nation that is in the promised land. This is the king who is the biggest, has the most command. And so what does he do? He gets a lot of the northern people together. Verse 4 it says, they came out with their troops, a great horde. We find out later that it's 420 thousand soldiers is what they came out with. 420,000 soldiers. Remember, Israel had at best about 40,000 soldiers. So it was 10 to 1 uh, at best, right? Uh, and so they come out and the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. The theme of Joshua, do not be afraid of them. This time I will give over to them slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Hamstring the horses simply means they would cut the back of their legs so that the horse could not walk, uh, could not run, could not pull could not be used in war to burn their chariots. Chariots were very deadly. If you were walking uh, on foot, somebody could come by with chariot, a driver with two soldiers on the side, and they could slay uh, just lines of people. Right. So this is a um, this is a prophetic statement of God telling them what they should do and what they will be able to do. They will cut. Uh, they cut the hamstrings of the horses. They will burn their chari chariots. They will defeat their military. That's ultimately what it means. Uh, so Joshua and all the warriors came suddenly against them by the waters of Merom. Uh, and so this was kind of like we would say a surprise attack. Even though Israel was small... 40,000 against over a 420,000, uh, they just surprise tacked them. They went for it. They took them over uh, and they struck them until, there, uh, until he left none remaining. Joshua killed them all. He left nothing um, remaining. No soldier uh, alive is exactly what God told them to do from the very beginning. Uh, it says that Joshua uh, did all that he was told to hamstring the horses, burn their chariots. Uh, they struck with the sword all who were in it, all were in it, devoting them to destruction, and there was none left with breath. And he burned Hazor with fire and all the cities of those kings and all the kings Joshua captured uh, and struck them with the edge of their sword, devoting them to destruction. Once again, there's that phrase, devoting them to uh, destruction. That word karim means a cursed, right? To giving them, honoring them to God. And so the killing of them all is devoted to God, the wrath of God. Uh, because they stood against the holiness of God. And so uh, that's what it means. A little interesting note, it says that they burned Hazor. Now, I told you Hazor was a huge city, a huge kingdom in the promised land. And today, I could take you to the place, tell Hazor, uh, the place where they have found Hazor. And what's interesting is at this time, in this age, uh, you can tell in all of the archaeology that the whole city was completely burned. Uh, burned so hot that it melted um pottery and did all sorts of things. And so archaeology proves uh, this, that this happened and it happened during this time. 
Uh, and so it goes on and says they destroyed all the city except for those who stood on mounds. Uh, so if it was up on a hill, they did not destroy it. But if it was a city not on a hill, they destroyed it. Why? Because Israel will later come in and take over these cities. And the cities that are on a hill are much easier to uh, fortify, much easier to protect. Uh, and so they kept those cities. They burned the ones that were in the valleys. And the people of Israel... Israel took everything for their plundering. But every person they struck with the edge of the sword until they destroyed them, uh, and they did not leave any who had breath, right? Uh, so once again, remember, uh, God told Moses, Moses told Joshua, Joshua told Israel to leave nobody left uh, that was against God. Uh, and so that's where we see um, in verse 15, uh, so Moses commanded Joshua and Joshua did, he left nothing undone. He did exactly what it has taken. And though we read very quickly um, just kind of a few battles, notice verse 18, it says Joshua made war a long time with those kings. This battle of the north took about seven years, okay? Uh, and you don't get this in this reading. You kind of have to read elsewhere in Chronicles and Kings um, to, to put all of it together. But it took about seven years for them to, to kind of take over the northern part, the largest, most populated part of the promised land. Uh, and so it made war a long time. Verse 20, and it was the Lord, the Lord's doing to harden the hearts that they should come against Israel in battle. Uh, and so the Lord was hardening the hearts. They were causing the north to hate Israel and to come against them. And God was allowing them to win victory after victory after victory, um, slowly defeating those people of the north. Verse 21, and Joshua came at that time and cut off uh, the uh, Anaki, all right, or the Anakim, or the Anaki is the original word, and this is what we would call the giants, okay? Uh, so think of the very western coast, Mediterranean um, part of it. Uh, this is where the Philistines uh, lived, uh, and that's where we see these cities that we know. And there were none of the Anaki left in the land, only in Gaza, in Gath, in Ashdod did some remain. And we will know that because why? Later on, a, a little teenage boy will come against a giant from Gath named Goliath. Uh, and so, once again, remember the promise that God told them. God said, I will give you everywhere that your foot will tread. And so, though we are reading about Israel going and defeating the promised land, they did not fulfill all that God had promised them. They could have wiped out the Philistines. They could have wiped out Goliath. They could have gone further north. They could have gone further south. They could have gone and expanded the territories. But even though they're doing good things and they have faith in God, as they're doing these good things, they are not putting full faith into God and going as far north as God said they could go, as far south as they could go, right? And as far west as they could go, or even as far east as they could go. Uh, and so Israel is faithful, but not completely faithful. And Joshua gave it for the inheritance of Israel according to their tribal allotments, and the land had rest from war. So after they did this, after seven years, it kind of calmed down for a little bit. It doesn't mean that the job was completed, but it does mean that overall war in the promised land settled down and it became very kind of regional uh, and even almost civil um, in between as Israel kept going and going and going and expanding their borders and pressing out the enemies that are hidden in some of these towns as they rode through the nation very, very quickly. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. So Israel came in from the Jordan River, came in from the east to the west, then they went south, and then they went north. And this took uh, several years uh, to do this. Uh, and now we have just, even though we've read 11 chapters, we've covered many years. And we will uh, hope that makes a little bit more sense. And we will see you tomorrow in chapter 12. God bless.